All right, welcome to the September 5th, 2023 uh, Aries Cloud Asian Python user group community meeting. Um, lots to talk about on the agenda. Um, releases published, tests failing, did peers to discuss and other uh, status reports and so on uh, issues. Um, we are recording the call. So we'll post that later. Um, reminder, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Um, uh, if anyone is new to the call and wants to introduce themselves, feel free to do so now. Um, just step up to the microphone and uh, introduce yourself and why you're here. All right. Um, announcements. Um, IIW is coming up October 10th to 12th in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, a number of us will be going. Hope to see folks there in person. Um, probably um, we'll start to think about um, specific presentations and sessions that we want to call as part of um, IIW. That'll be coming up over the next several weeks. Um, the Hyperledger Member Summit is on uh, October, October. Hmm. Let's get rid of one of those. October 23rd uh, in San Francisco and Tokyo. So um, there is one in the Bay Area. Um, so there's a link in there to the Member Summit. There will be identity sessions um, and so on uh, at that meeting. And then a Reminder that there is a new Zoom link for the Aries Working Group call. So um, for those who are familiar and join us each Wednesday, um, there is a new Zoom link this Zoom link this week. So if you have uh, in your uh, in your calendar the uh, the link, the Zoom has changed. So that's for tomorrow's meeting. Um, so make sure you note that. Any other announcements from anyone that we should add to this? Anyone have anything they want to um, bring the group's attention to? All right. Um, release 0101 was published. Notice it's 0101, not 0100. Um, when we went to publish, um, PyPy gave us an error that the um, source code zip file existed already. Not sure how it could have existed already, but um, uh, when we did 0, 010, 0, so we immediately um, bumped up the um, version number to 0, 0101 and republished so that PyPy would have all of the necessary artifacts. Um, so that's been done. Um, uh, 0, 010 0 has been out for a bit, and then we um, merged a couple more P PRs, and now the um, Aries agent test harness is failing. Um, almost certainly the issue is the poetry um, link, which kind of makes sense that um, since AATH's Docker file only has um, the pip install part of it, um, that's what's causing us grief. Um, Daniel, you mentioned um, being able to use the nightly build, and um, I, I think that's a good idea, and we could transition to that. The only issue that I see with that is it's really nice to be able to um, pull in a current commit and run the tests, um, or uh, run the tests easily with a um, an existing um uh, a, 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 a branch off somebody else's, um, somebody else's repo off a fork or anything else. And we can do that really easily today in AATH. Um, so that would be the only thing we'd lose. I'd like to find a way that we could do, um, use nightly for, um, for most of the AATH runs, but to, um, still be able to grab a commit. So we might be able to do both. Um, probably the right thing to get past this immediate problem is to switch to the nightlies. Uh, any comments, suggestions from there? 
Um, that makes sense. Uh, being able to to pull in changes from wherever and 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 run them in, in the Aries agent test harness, I think, is is definitely something that I agree we would want to be able to retain that ability. Um, there might be some options there for like building from like cloned code, building an image, and then just being able to trivially use that image rather than pulling one um, yeah. within the ATH stuff. Uh, but yeah, that makes sense. Interestingly, it was doing exactly that that allowed me to under that realize that it was the poetry PR causing all the grief. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, I uh, all I did, you go in and just tweak one file and um, then you can run you know, the, the test run in a GitHub action, uh, run a run set and, and get it done. So um, really hate to lose that feature. But uh, on the other hand, just making it easy to use the, it would also be much, much faster and way less resources if we use the, um, uh, the, the nightly run. Okay, right. we've got to figure out how to get that fixed. Um, we'll talk about it as a team um, at some point to figure out who can do it, um, you know, and later today or tomorrow um, to get that resolved. So we've got to figure out that one. Um, the two commits are there, as I say, but um, it's clearly the poetry one that causes and it makes sense that it is so. Okay. Um, next one up is did peer progress and discussion um, is I'm not seeing Jason wanted to talk today. Um, J Jason Syro talk, but I'm not seeing him on the call, unfortunately. Um, Daniel, um, do you, I mean, the two things I wanted to mention, make sure this community knew about it in case you missed the um, meeting last week on the Aries working group was did peer four um, has been introduced. Um, Daniel, um, some things are happening in the did peer spec. First of all, the did peer spec's been updated to remove all of the things that were, as I put them, aspirational when the did um, spec was put together. Um, notably, the ideas of you know being able to update a peer did um, and things like that that just never um, came to be, came to fruition. There was no protocols created. There was no Aries um, ways to rotate keys in dids um and as did did peer uh, sorry as did com moved along it became clear that uh it wasn't needed and so um that that all of that sort of baggage in the did peer spec has been removed the next thing we want to do is both introduce did peer 4 and deprecate all of the other did peer zero, did peer one, did peer two, and did peer three sort of deprecate those. So those, um, that's the intention that we will do in the next uh, short while. And and then the last thing is to mention what did peer four is. And did peer four, for those that missed it, um, was an idea that Daniel Bloom and Sam Curran put together and basically is did peer two and three combined into a single mechanism. Did peer two is a um, is a way to express within a the did identifier um, a, a, an encoding of the did doc upon which it's based. Did peer three is a way to reference the did peer two identifier, um, but in a short form, so that you are not every time you're using the did every time you're uh, you you are referencing uh, just a short version of the did peer two that was already transmitted. Um, did peer four has the same concepts, but um, combines a short form and a long form um, did where the short um, and and he does that in a way compatible or in the in the in the same manner, the same technique, not I shouldn't say compatible, but in the same technique that um, uh, did ion uses and and any side tree based um, did method. And basically it has a short form of the did and a long form of the did. Um, they are 
uh, also known as for one another. And it allows us to do the same thing that did peer two and three um, did, which is on the very first use, you send the long form did. On any other uses, you can send the short form with the assumption that um, the peer that you're communicating with has already has already kept it. So um, that's what did peer four is. And then, uh, so any questions on that? Any comments? Okay. That, that sounds pretty good, I think. I was surprised to find out that the short form did peer three isn't the same as the prefix of did peer two, I guess. I thought you could just strip it off, but I, I think it hashes it again. Yeah, it hashes the the actual identifier. Hmm. That was the the plan. Did peer four um, also changes how did peer four basically encodes the did doc and doesn't do any of the fancy handling that did peer two does. It just simply says you can use any did doc, and it encodes the did doc, and then. The short form is a hash, I believe. Daniel, what's the short form of did peer four? It is indeed a hash over the encoded document. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds easy. So yeah, did peer two encodes the document, did peer, uh, sorry, short form did peer four hashes the did doc, long form encodes the did doc. Does it include the hash? A prefix or yes yeah so the the full did peer four is did colon peer colon four followed by the hash in multi-base encoding and then followed by another colon and then followed by the the full encoded document um yeah uh, there's links in that issue there, there is. at the top to uh um where that's all defined yeah yeah sounds good Okay. Um, and then the next thing that happened was the introduction introduction, and maybe Daniel or somebody could put the um, link to the RFC PR. Um, but the introduction of a new RFC called Rotate Did for Didcom message ID. So this is for um, Didcom V1, which has never had a rotate did. Um, this allows simply a message that you send over that says rotate my did to this. Um, and the expectation is that um, uh, the other side would simply update their their various um, connection related um, data to use the rotated did and send back an ACK. And then we added with that um, as a follow on to this um, to the initial proposal is a way to hang up. So. Um, the other message within the rotate did is a rotate did hang up, which basically says I'm no longer going to respond to uh, anything on this relationship. Something we had long talked about as it's not you, it's me, um, or the breakup protocol. Now it's called hang up. So that's all in there. Um, right now we're work wrapping up work. Um, to move from unqualified to qualified dids. Jason is almost completed that work. Um, and um, wanted to get together to have a conversation about that, but I guess that will follow Daniel, Andrew, um, if you could coordinate with um, with Jason as to when that, that meeting will happen today. He wanted to have it today. Oh, Jason Syrotuck is here. Hello. Um, did you want to use this meeting to talk over the wrapping up of this work, or or is it such that it's really just an Andrew Daniel you meeting? I think um, given there's some decisions to make relatively quickly, I think a smaller forum, but I can certainly provide an update um, yeah. to to the group. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I've been looking into limiting to peer two. There's kind of multiple components to that. Um, when I got into it, um, and maybe I'll kind of break down what Daniel Bloom. So there's a pull request that's open. I don't know if it's linked. Um, I don't 
see it there. Um, 249 is the issue. The pull request is 2353. Um, and in that pull request, I've, there's multiple changes. So there's a couple of the components of the fact that one, we want to resolve. We know we, we want Akamai to know how to resolve these bids. And that's relatively simple. Um, deconstructing the did peer twos and um, converting those into did peer threes um, is relatively straightforward. Um, the other components are the fact that we obviously want to leverage that. We want to detect when we've received did peer twos. We want to resolve them accordingly. Um, we also want to make this part of the community coordinated updates. So by default, it's going to have its existing behavior. Um, it's going to continue to send unqualified dids unless you've set a specific flag for, for testing purposes. Um, and if you receive a did peer two, we want to respond with a did peer two because clearly um, the counterpart is is compatible and, and understands that, and that's the, the preference. So that is um, relatively straightforward. Um, the complexity arised in the fact that how Akapai has handled existing connections and existing did documents. Um, it has a custom did dot class that relies on some old, or expects some old shapes. Um, the context link of how the, the did doc should work is the right link, but that spec's been updated. And the doc, the old doc, the document is actually using values that aren't in its own context. Um, so we've been really discussing on how to um, update Akapai to uh, specifically to use PyDid um, and its did document um, specification. Um, it's got much better typing, it's got um, enforcement, and it's up to date with the actual spec. Um, but we have all these old documents lying around. So how do we manage it? Do we put in two streams that use old classes and old methods for the old docs? Um, or do we try and upgrade or update the old documents to become um, in this new class, um, which um, there are a couple ways to do. Um, and we've got, so there's some discussion here on what exactly the best way forward is. Um, and it's also kind of my first time diving into the unit tests, which has caused some um, some hiccups. So um, yeah, uh, sorry, not super prepared for this, but I've been working on this for a while. Um, so hopefully that provides some context. Um, if people are interested in the, the did peer work, um, feel free to reach out to me on Discord, or you can um, sh uh, you can uh, obviously reply and comment to that. Part of the discussion is the fact that that pull request has 45 changed files, and it, it does multiple things. So part of the discussion is to, to decompose that into more targeted changes. Um, that are iterative um, so that they can be better understood by, by the community and with a little less risk because we're talking about changing the way connections are established. Um, so we want to make sure that we have really good confidence and we, we, we take incremental steps without overhauling anything um, too dramatically. So um, yeah, the, the usage of these things is the same, the, the out-of-band protocol. It, it's just the dids and the documents that are being exchanged and how they get stored and how they get managed. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the workflows are the same. It's just the artifacts that are getting class passed around. Um, Steven, anything you want me to touch on or is there any questions from the, the group? That sounds good. And you missed the, the section where we're outlining did peer four. Right. Um, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll click on those links and I'll maybe I'll, maybe I'll check them and see later. Cause yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really going to be a very minor tweak from your um what's going on with did peer two and three basically combines those in most of those changes the the implementation will be in um presumably in the peer did library mm -hmm. yeah i hope so there's a couple yeah. things that need to be added to that um but uh yeah it's, it's it's open and available so making this update should be pretty straightforward yeah the concepts are totally the same to did peer two and three so perfect yeah <clears throat> okay um any other questions or comments on the unqualified to qualified dids transition we're making good okay um 
update again uh, this time, Jason Sherman. If you have anything to to comment on the and on Krebs Rust and Akapai, anything you want to say about that, or that work continues on and you're making progress. Yeah, that's really about it. It's the um, it's probably hopefully next meeting I'll have something more to talk about, which would know what is missing during the transition or what things people will have to be aware of when we kind of publish this out. So. Um, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's ongoing. Daniel. So I, I just wanted to, um, I guess, check back in. Are, are we still waiting on uh, a, a new release of the Anon Creds RS library before we go through with merging main? Is that what we're waiting on still? No, it's the, the revocation API hasn't been updated. So regard, regardless of the non creds RS stuff, um, which we should have the latest one before we do it, but there's still the 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 API as it sits isn't fully implemented or finished for what we had talked about in the issue um, using a non cred. So hopefully I can finally wrap that up this week and then we can um, do some polishing and get the latest um, Rust package in there. Yeah. The issue, the most recent issue run into was just the the mapping of the different revocation um, items from the old um, slash revocation uh, end, end point to the anon creds slash revocation end point with the idea being we would, you know, we sort of redirect the existing endpoint to the implementation of the new endpoint but that was problematic with the revocation just because there's so many things that changed in the data structure so now we've got to a point i believe jason is you know what you can safely ignore what what breaking changes are permitted in particularly in the response coming back and 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 therefore can update both the um, implementation of the endpoint plus the um, unit test cases. Yeah, so that that's kind of the, yeah, where I'm at right now is okay. I've done what I think I can do. Now I've got to go do, which I should have probably started with, is there's some BDD tests that do the endpoints, but not all. So it's kind of, I don't know if I'm going to have to go back and actually write my own stuff to understand exactly what the previous um responses were and compare so it may be a little bit more work but the, the problem with the unit tests themselves is <laughs> um when talking about a root is everything's mocked underneath the root so it basically it just tests that are you passing in the right parameters does it blow up when we expect it to blow up so it's a it's not of any use when you're trying to do this to say like hey i expect this re this actual response back exactly um, so there are some in the BDD tests, which I just had blinders on and didn't, because they were commented out, I didn't, I forgot that I commented them out. So that's where I'm back to now. Hopefully that'll really, um, you know, push this forward, um, so that I'm not kind of coding blind, um, so to say. Um, and then if there's still some gaps, I'll probably have to write some scripts to hit, uh, an actual instance look at the responses compared to what I'm actually doing now. So, but I think I think the ball's rolling now, and hopefully I'll <laughs> be a little less frustrated, and we'll have some good progress. And um, but yeah, as it stands, we're um, we're not quite at the point where it's just the non creds RS package that we need to update. There's still I've still got to do some Akamai coding. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that that makes sense. So uh, maybe to ask a little bit more pointedly on the non creds RS side of things, has there been a release with the changes that are analogous to those that were made in the Indy Credx 1.0 release? No. Okay. So <laughs> there, there's a series of tickets still, right? So um, I believe you and Andrew are going to have to work on um, the areas that were touched in both the non creds and the Indy Credx stuff. Um, right. And sorry, I, I'm, I'm not being very precise with my questioning here. <laughs> so I, I'm asking more on the rust side of things. Oh, okay. Maybe sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, whether there has been a, a release of, of our dependent library, um, for us to pull in yet. Andrew, so uh, the, the question is a little odd because, because we, 
CredX pulls in the anon creds. Oh no, it pulls in CL signatures. Mm -hmm. Has a non creds been updated to pull in the new and non cred CL signatures? Yeah, I think that's all merged. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, I had a couple of PRs updating to newer versions there. But we've the the most recent release on the non creds RS library is only the zero one zero, and that was released on June second. We're still we still yeah, need so a build a new, for yeah okay. release. Okay, so there has not been a release. Ah ah. So PRs have been merged, but we don't have a release with those PRs yet. Oh okay, that's huge. Okay, <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> um, it. it is is it the um wrappers that are holding that up um there's not much lined up on there there's a couple of little fixes um and a new kotlin wrapper okay so there's no re reason the release hasn't been done it just hasn't been done i don't think so uh I know the, the animal guys have been updating everything to Node.js 18. Uh, I'm not sure if it was done for this crate, but it could be done in, in another version as well. Wait, you don't exist anymore? <laughs> oh, well. Um, I don't. You, uh, <laughs> let's get that on your plate to to push through that release. I assume you're the one that would do that release or or trigger it. Uh, I mean, I haven't been doing the releases on the non-creds. OK, the animal guys have been do doing that? Yeah, it looks like Timo did the last one. OK. Um, although I, I think I just have to hit the release button. Do it. <laughs> well, there's a couple little PRs. All right. Well, we definitely need that done as soon as possible. I didn't, I did I, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. I didn't realize that hadn't been done. I, I think when we have that, um, uh, my time is still limited, unfortunately, but I, I think I should be able to squeeze in some time to work on getting main merged in, uh, okay. to the non-creds RS and, I'm I'm hoping that that will be isolated enough from the work that uh, uh, Jason's been doing that I I should be able to do that in parallel, um, but I'll I'll of course uh, be communicative about that and if I run into any issues I'll I'll let you know. Okay. Good conversation. Yeah, Andrew, if you could anything you can do to make that release um, happen sooner than later. If it's okay. just hitting a button, go for it. Well, there's two PRs here. The the JavaScript wrapper I noticed wasn't actually releasing any of the strings and, and things passed over the FFI. So it was right, I've been seeing those conversations going back and forth. I thought that was what was holding up. I think that I think PR is ready to go. But, However, um, I didn't realize that we have never done a release since the CL signatures was merged and that's huge. We definitely need that as soon as possible. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, please push that one to the top. Um, okay, any other questions, comments on the uh, Hyperledger and non creds Rust? Okay. Um, <clears throat> updated, um, Daniel, you had these from last week. We wanted to talk about the message type prefix. Um, so basically, uh, it is a configuration to add the HTTPS. So this is the switch from, for message, um, message identifiers. Way back in the day, message identifiers had a prefix of a did 
that um, a did solve that Daniel Hardman created in the middle of a meeting. Um, a long time ago, we agreed it would be updated to HTTPS. Um, Akapai has never made that the default. And so you still have to use a command line option or a, a configuration option to make using the HTTP um, a prefix. I think we should have a breaking change that adds, uh, removes that, um, defaults it to HTTPS and adds, and perhaps adds a, an option dash dash really old. Um, the code is written so that it handles both regardless. So I think we, it, it, we're safe enough not even to put an option in to use the old, but we just switch to the new. Are we good with that? Sounds good to me. It has indeed been a really long time. So I think if there's yeah. any implementations that are still using the old stuff, I think they're they're probably the ones that should be making some changes at this point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll outline that change and get this one pushed to the top as far as let's make this happen. Um, likewise, I think this one, I'm less, I'm less familiar. Um, I know we're supposed to have, I'm not even sure where exactly this goes. Um, Daniel, do you have <clears throat> use and accept updated media types? Is that in the service block? Uh, it's actually on when we're posting messages to the endpoint. Oh, right. The MIME type associated with that HTTP request, I believe, is what that's referring to. Andrew, do you have any sort of where we are with this one? Um, I don't remember if there's a configuration flag or... I think to, to change it. I mean, we've accepted the newer MIME type for a long time, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure we ever explicitly checked and and failed uh, regardless of what the MIME type was set to, actually. Um, yeah, probably yeah. true. So th for this one, we have to put in this MIME type as we send messages. And then it, that's the change, right? Yeah. Instead of that mime type, we use the one from the spec. Okay. <laughs> I love how this doesn't quite outline what what the one is that we're supposed to be using, and no link on it. Shoot. Okay. I'll find that's in the envelope, right? Um, actually, there is a flag emit new did com line type, so we can just change the default there. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. So the two changes are to those two emit flags, because I know the other one is emit. We just make those the default and don't offer an option not to use them. Yep. Okay, good. We can, yeah, we can leave the flags in for now and print a warning potentially. Do what we did for the um, Indy flag or, or the use of the Indy wallet, which is put a deprecation notice. We can do that same sort of thing into the log. Yep. Um, okay. That reminds me that um, another thing <clears throat> we've got to do in AATH that I just posted an issue for is um, AATH is still using the Indy SDK. So we definitely want this one to be changed uh, as soon as possible. So that, again, should be a trivial change in AATH. Um, the poetry one is more involved if we do that, the nightly build. Um, but But definitely just changing that flag to remove it. I did a 
interestingly, we've had a test that has failed for a year or more um, that no one's ever looked into. And I actually updated it to use um, a new 090 flag about using a public did and suddenly that test passes now. So that was kind of fun. Um, okay. Um, the, the other one that I wanted to talk about, we uh, Sam Curran is gonna be talking to some folks at Hitachi in Japan. Um, about uh, long-term support for Aries. And I'm not sure whether they're talking about um, Akapai itself or Aries or, or which libraries. Um, but I, I just wondered for anyone, um, I, I'm not exactly sure. I sort of was brainstorming here about what long-term support would mean. So uh, the from what I hear going into the meeting with the meetings, not till tomorrow. And actually I'm it's uh, Sam Curran's going to be on it. I'm not going to be able to make it, but um, <clears throat> Hitachi is offering to fund the long-term support for Aries. And so I started thinking about what that would mean of how would we implement long-term support um, for, for Akapai. Um, I don't know if anyone else has experience in long-term support <laughs> products and setting the what the baseline is. I assume we would find um, a long-term support version of Python and an operating system. Um, and then basically have a, a version that runs using that version of Python and that OS, and then monitor dependencies, um, tag that, monitor dependencies and then cherry pick uh, and update them on the branch, update the dependencies on the branch as they evolve and cherry pick Akapai PRs from the main branch into that long-term support branch. Um, is that is is there more to it than that? Uh, anyone with any experience on it or anyone have comments on on whether whether that's the approach? Uh, I mean, usually when you're talking about long-term support, you're talking about a commitment yes. from some organization. Yeah. That's the only thing that comes to my mind right now. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right, Stephen, to have, um, you need to decide what dependencies you want to pin against. Yeah, which ones you want to float, right? So, do you want to be pinned to a particular LTS OS, right, yeah. uh, or not? So, what what things? And then, um, and then there's two flavors of updates that you need to consider. First and foremost, security updates, and then the second are bug fixes. And so, yeah. you know, what's going to be eligible? And in LTS, the idea is no features, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, maintaining an LTS, I think, is uh, the longer the time period is, the harder it is, because you you diverge further and further from your active code base. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, yeah, and LTS releases can like some of them can overlap as well, like Node.js yeah. and. Ubuntu both have LTS strategies and they have LTSs that overlap. So anyway, it's not much more to say about it. Yeah. So so basically pick the time frame. So commitment from the organization, time frame, two to three years, something like that. Plan for the next. For Akapai, this is the big one. Um, we're very close to having AIP2 complete with the with the peer did and the um and encryption envelope things were very close. As far as I know, the only thing we are not supporting is the please ACK, um, which is probably was probably a mistake <laughs> to include in um AIP2. Uh, but that's the one that 
needs to be implemented um, to technically complete um, AIP2. Um, the OS, I realized as I was listening to this, the OS sort of defines what version of Python is shipped with it. So it's really picking it, uh, 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 an LTS OS. And that would define, therefore, the LTS version of Python. Um, and um, I guess it would be more than target the version of Python associated with the OS and other dependencies. Um, monitor dependencies and update them on the branch. Um, and then cherry pick APIs or uh, Akapai PR suitable for LTS, which is security fixes, obviously new, new features, no. Okay, that's helpful. Um, any other comments from anyone? Does, do we think we have that? I will share that with Sam as we go forward um, with that meeting tomorrow and we'll see what comes out of it. It would be great if um, Hadashi does want to um, pick up that, be the organization that commits to providing that support. So, Stephen, one other thing that pops to mind is uh, ensuring that your uh, the infrastructure required to support the old versions uh, and test them uh, and build them uh, is uh, is maintained. Yeah, I mean that's a lot easier these days. Yeah, but it means that you can't just kind of evolve your infrastructure to support your new needs, right? You need to. Yeah. Sometimes you have to fork your infrastructure and have multiple <laughs> things running. So, yeah. Yeah. So one other thing I would say, and this has less to do with maintaining an LTS and more about what it is that you want to promote is, um, you know, is the suggestion to the community going to be that, you know, when, when you're talking about deploying something new that you should be deploying on LTS or should you be uh, like, so what is the disposition of the new stream that is not yet LTS, right? Is it deemed to be experimental or is it deemed to be, um, you know, right. what you should go on unless you need LTS or like, so the whole positioning of those things needs to be, I think, mm -hmm. thought about as well. Yeah. Steven, uh, does this also include interoperability with other agents and the maintenance and improvement of the test harness? That's a that's a great one and hopefully, but good one to bring up. So what that would do, I think, is is that good if I could spell maintenance. Um, um we would want to have a test agent that is the LTS versions that are active and and those would be run beside the Akapai main so that in AATH we wouldn't just run Akapai main but we would also run the LTS version oh man there we go. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any others? All of these are great.
what would be the criteria for LTS to be not an LTS anymore? Meaning, like for example, uh, Akapai will have did PF4 or did rotator. When something has been introduced and the main branch LTS does not make, like what Warren was talking about that yeah. this is the version to use, when does it become not a version to use? I mean, as far as I know, it's 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 sort of um, what was mentioned here of things like the things it it we we basically pick a time frame for the LTS. Um, so is it aligned with to me the LTS OS, which is aligned then with the you know things like the version of Python on it. Um, yeah. So are we saying that the decision in LTS is an LTS based on time and Python support? Does it not have anything to do with what's in the Akapai main branch and as a development has progressed? Because we've, let's say we've found something because of which staying on an old LTS branch is really not the best choice for people. Um, th this session right now is just a brainstorming of what are the questions to come up with. Mm -hmm. So not saying absolutely on anything. Um, Hitachi presumably has much more experience in, in taking on long-term support for something. And so what I'm trying to do is sort of get my head and get Sam's head around, okay, these are the ideas we would think of that come into play with Akapai. Um, and then so that we go into the meeting to talk about these things. So in answer to the question, I don't know. Warren? Yeah, one other consideration um, is uh, migration. So um, ensuring that uh, however long the, um, the LTS is, that there is a migration to uh, the latest and greatest, and especially if you have overlapping old LTSs, it's like, how do you get from here to there? Yeah. I mean, we're already thinking about that and already have an implementation mechanism in Akapai. Um, so I think we're doing that. I think the, that hopefully should be taken care of in, in, in ongoing releases, but yes, absolutely correct. This, this reminds me, one of the things we've got to do in, um, we need a feature, need feature to not run tests when the test agent has not changed. <laughs> so one of the things we need to do, we run, we're getting, you know, uh, exponential, um, you know, number of test agents squared number of tests run. So we run all the tests against every other agent. Um, we need to make sure that when we have a pair of agents that haven't changed, that we don't rerun the tests. Um, so we minimize the the number of tests run. Um, so something to think of if, if someone has an idea there of, of how we can detect that an agent has not changed um, and therefore we should not run, or, or sorry, when a pair of agents have not changed and therefore we shouldn't run the test set because that will be very common with this branch. Um, and it's a, it's a big enough problem we have today. It would be nice to solve it. I'll put an issue in for that. Okay. Um, that's all that's Stephen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I just thought of one other thing, which is, uh, to consider um, the effects that there may be on community coordinated updates. Yeah. If you're gonna have LTSs, then it may restrict what you can consider for that. Yeah. So it's gonna really change the whole interop 
story, I think. I've got to say, it's kind of exciting, though, that somebody is interested in this. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, as I say, I, I have had nothing more than they want to talk about this. So um, I'm intrigued. All right. Any other topics? Thank you for that. That was uh, extremely helpful. Okay. Well, that's all I had planned for this. Um, Andrew, Daniel, um, Jason Syro, you might want to jump on, um, or I could stop the recording and you guys could stay on this. Um, but other than that, um, that wraps up our meeting. Thanks all for attending and see you in another week uh, for the maintainers meeting and two weeks for now for the next uh, ACAPUG meeting. Great. Thanks, everyone.